This is Eric Guy, Technical Product Specialist with Ameritor. We're going to talk about wheel ends today. We're going to kind of focus on a conventional wheel end and the repair and setup of those bearings versus going into the other details of preloaded as well as unitized wheel ends. So let's, what are good characteristics for a wheel seal? One, multi-sealing points. Ideally, the more the better, four points is ideal. A strong casting so it doesn't deflect or bend as you're installing it. Spring-loaded primary lips. A good bore to shaft adherence. Low rubber swell. Resistance to vibration and forgiveness when you have a worn or misaligned shaft. The sealing material ought to be resistant to the type of lube you're using as well as the contaminant. So let's talk about the primary elastomers used in seals today. Leather has been around for 100 years and is probably the oldest material that is, is out in the industry. It's been replaced by various synthetic rubber materials for cost and capability. Leather works well in low temperature climates and it has good durability in dirty environments. So today, it's widely still used in Canada because of the cold temperatures, but today most leathers have a compound of rubber impregnated into the leather to help give it some dirt uh, flexibility in those colder environments. Let's talk about NBR rubber. Nitrite. It's the most commonly used rubber material for seal today. Well-rounded capabilities for general lubes in the industry. It's relatively low cost and Nitrite has a low temperature range, so it can work better than some of the other uh, floral elastomer seals like light. Hydrated uh, nitrite rubber, or HNBR, has a good balance of high and low temperature. Compatible with synthetic lubes, its cost is similar to a light ton. Uh, low temperature capability is, is makes it more versatile for wheel seal applications and it's the most popular rubber that would be used in a premium seal. Silicone, it's got the best temperature range by far. Um, it has a disadvantage that it has a low tear resistance, so it kind of eliminates itself from being used as a in a rotating lip uh, material environment. Uh, floral elastomers are right on, a popular seal material in automotive. It has a little bit of a poor uh, temperature capability, and with a poor temperature capability, if you add something, it becomes rather expensive. PTFE, which is really not a rubber but a plastic, is utilized in, in, in sealing lips in highly high demanding applications. It's unidirectional, so they have to impregnate hydrodramatic acid to basically improve the flexibility of the lip. Those seals, that material is also very expensive, so it's limited use in the industry to those demanding applications. So, temperature factor, how does it affect the seal? Well, rubber hardens with time and temperature, even in the ambient environment. So what are the properties to the rubber? I mean, you have hardness, you've got a compression set, how does it age in the air, how does it age in oil? What's the brace of resistance and how's the resistance to the ozone? Those are some of the factors you have to think about. So typical installation issues is probably cause is due to misalignment. If you're using, uh, installing the seal into uh, a hub with the dual stool attached, you're going to have to use a dolly to ensure your alignment is proper as you install the hub back onto the spindle. Damage to the face during Installation using the wrong tools, a hammer on the edge can dent the surface. Sharp edges on the entrance to the bore where the seal is installed can cut the outer housing and cause these. Typical kind of installation problems. Benefits of the Meritor seal is it actually has a 70,000 uh, thick plate of metal that helps give it durability in uh, incidental strikes with a hammer during installation or in, inappropriate installations. It's very stiff section. You can see through the red arrows how it, it basically directs the force through the low friction barrier to install the seal into the bore. 
We have lead-ins on the internal and external diameters of the seat. Some additional benefits is the multi-lateral zone that we have. It allows it to have the flow friction as a barrier and two internal contact seals as dust barriers before we get to the actual lubrication seal. So as we look at the air side, you can see how the dirt path has to go through the low friction barrier, pass into sealing lip one, the sailing lift two to help keep the dirt contaminants from ever re reaching the actual primary seal. Let's talk about the oil side. The blue arrows show the path of the oil to lubricate and, and cool the actual primary seal. We also have a shielding device that actually shields the seal from debris as well as uh, helps dissipate temperature by heat and by being a heat. So Meritorious premium seals can be either in oil or grease applications from a negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It can be installed by hand or with a common industry driver that's available from any of the suppliers in the marketplace. We talked about again the key design feature being the multi-zone labyrinth design and the low friction barrier being two of the key points in design, then the hydronated nitrite rubber giving us that temperature resistance up to 300 degrees and better wear resistance with synthetic loops. Part numbers for a TN axle would be MER0243 for a TP axle, MER0223, common industry numbers. We also feature it in our three and five year hub service kits. So, hub types. So there are multiple hub types out there. We're going to focus on the conventional N-play type hub and a preloaded version with our tool Dr. Preload. Pre-adjusted is common with a comment preset hub. And then of course we have several unitized hubs in the marketplace. We will not talk about those latter two. So trailer wheel and spindle types. The most common is a TN PQ axle spindle. It's a tapered spindle. The TP is second and it is the parallel spindle. And then the TR is the most common drive axle design. There are other variants out there that we won't go into today, but those are the most common. So spindle preparation. Removing any wear sleeves from the previous seal. Inspect the shoulder for nicks or roughness. Clean the spindle completely with emery cloth down to bare metal. A critical issue is cleaning the spindle area at least another half inch further than the previous seal was installed is a critical piece because we don't know for certain, <coughs> especially we're changing brands of seals, how far that seal will extend or pile it on that spindle. So you must clean it back and I use a half inches uh, on target area. But it must be cleaned down to bare metal Cleaning with a rag is not an option. So, spindle verification. Verify that the seal will slide up on the spindle prior to installing it in the hub. We can eliminate then some of those hidden failures that caused by the seal didn't pilot properly and it binds it up and therefore it will fail. The rule of thumb is you should be able to wiggle that seal on with your thumbs on that ceiling surface. Top preparation, clean the cavity and bore completely of all the previous lubrications. Use emery cloth to clean the bore for the bearing as well as the seal down the bare metal. Cleaning with a rag is just not enough. That would be your final step with a little solvent to clean off any residues. Seal installation, again we said we can install the seal with your hand or with an industry driver, um, use the flat side of the driver against the face of our seal. Again, we have 70 thousandths of steel there, so it's very uh, rigid, and uh, it will uh, allow you to uh, drive that in with virtual no uh, resistance. So common wheel and retention types. So if you look 
through the list here, on the top here, we've uh, identified the temper lock as the Meritor dual system nut. When I say dual system, you can actually use it for a common end play wheel end, or you can use it with a doctor preload, preloaded or uh, preloading bearing setup. So it has a dual purpose. The only one in the industry that allows you to do that. Next on the list is the preset specialized nut system for the Comet Hub. One piece nut systems are becoming prominent in the marketplace. Two piece nut systems have been around for quite a while. The most common ones are the ones with the uh, nut and snap ring. And then the three and four piece are probably the oldest in the system. So let's talk about preload versus end play. As you can see, the bar graph shows you that once you go into preload, you actually get the maximum amount of life if you don't preload it too far. It's a fine-tuned measurement. So you need some type of tool to do that. Otherwise, you look to the right, you'll see the conventional end play setup and how it doesn't allow for as much bearing life, and it degrades quickly once you're outside of the 5,000th end play. So let's look at the roller contact versus life. So when you're in that preloaded area, you've got over 210 degrees of load on those bearing surfaces, optimizing that bearing. As you go to zero, you're at about 180 loading on that bearing. And when you're in the end play mode, from one to five, you're in about 45 degrees of contact or load zone. So you can see how the bearing is going to live longer with a slight level preload. So let's talk about our tool that works with the temper lock nut called Dr. Preload. It's a measured, precise, and repeatable setting process to preload a bearing every time by every technician. It also improves tire life because you have less uh, movement at the spindle, optimizes bearing, spindle, and seal life, no end play, and has fewer ABS faults. It's fast, it's easy to install, it's fairly streamlined, comparable to the same amount of time you use to use a torque wrench to install the wheel end. Again, the adjustments are outlined in SAE J2535. Standard, if you want more information, go to publication SP1520 for Dr. Brito. Let's talk about a little bit about the installation. So you can see there is a list of different nut sizes available for uh, the different spindle lines. So very first thing you're going to do in the first steps in, in the RP618 that we're going to go over is to kind of seat the bearing and in, cup into the floor by putting an amount of 200 foot pounds of pressure on it. Um, the tool, we still recommend that you put that kind of pressure. You don't necessarily have to meter it with a torque wrench if you want, you can. But we do want you to take a breaker bar and tighten it up into that 200 pound range a couple of times as you spin the hub just to make sure the bearing is seated prior to putting the tool on. Next, install the tool onto the end of the spindle by threading it on. Make sure the jaws are behind the nut and touching the outer bearing on the inner race. Take the T-handle, rotate it in until we start to see loading on the gauge. You see the gauge in the center. We're going to load that gauge all the way up until we get to the green location. Now at this point in time, just like 618 under load, you want to rotate the hub. So you'll rotate the hub and ironically when you rotate the hub, you'll see that gauge drop outside of the green. That means the rollers are being pre-positioned. You need to tighten the handle clockwise a little bit farther, bring it back into the green location, rotate that hub again. Do that as many times as you need to make sure that needle stays in the green. That confirms everything is seated properly under a heavy preload. We are not going to leave it here. So we're going to now turn the T-handle counterclockwise, releasing some pressure. We're going to bring that dial back down closer to zero, but not to zero. There are some pre-described lines that tell you if it's a TN, TP, and or uh, a different wheel line, depending on the size of the, uh, the spline size, or I should say the thread size of the end of the spin. At that point in time, 
we've got the light preload section. So the next step is hand tighten the nut until it contacts. Align one of the marks on the nut to a mark on the end of the tool. That mark is parallel with the groove or the uh, slot in the spindle itself. It'll help you to install the snap ring without having to adjust. Now back off the tool several turns and remove it from the wheel end. At this point in time, install the, install the snap ring into the groove, making sure the three points are completely uh, uh, set into the, the slot in the nut itself. I always use a socket and a small bar and attempt to try to move that after the snap ring is installed to confirm that the snap ring is seated and will not come out. So let's change speeds. Let's go to a conventional wheel end setup. And we'll use TMC's RP618B procedure. Okay, so the first step when installing the bearings, you want to lubricate those bearings with the type of lubrication that's being used either in a drive axle or a hub. At that point in time, do not pack any grease into that bearing. If you had a grease field, uh, grease-filled wheel end, you would uh, pack the bearing with grease and you'd pack the cavity. We do not want you to pack bearings with grease on an oil field system. Two, after the hub bearings have been installed, install it up on the spindle. Take your inner nut, tighten it up, or if it's a two-piece system, take the nut up to contact. Put a wrench on it, torque wrench, and torque it up to 200 foot-pounds while rotating the hub. Just to confirm, apply that load at least three times while you're rotating the hub so you can confirm you achieve the 200 foot pounds of loading. Now, step three, back that off one complete turn and rotate the wheel. Step four, we want to reapply another load but at a lower setting. So if it's a three or four piece nut system, you're only going to apply 50 foot pounds of torque on that second uh, preloading. If it's a two-piece system, a nut with a snap ring, you're going to apply 100 foot-pounds due to the difference in threads. Again, apply three times the load, three times applying that load, so that you can confirm that. Now, you have to back it off a specific increment. That is according to the table one. On the next page that I'll show you, you can also you refer to Meritor's document TP89159. At this point, do not rotate that hub. When we back it off, we're going to be from a sixteenth of an inch to a third of a turn, and we don't know until you watch and look at the table. Here's the table. The table outlines how much you turn that nut back off or back off that nut, depending on the type of thread pitch for TMC guidelines. Now, we need to install the locking washer. So in a three, three or four piece nut system, the inner nut has a dial pin on it and the washer has either a tang or it has actually a hole drilled into it. You're going to slide the washer up on through the slotted part of the spindle and it may or may not line up. So at that point in time, you need to remove that washer back and you may have to loosen the nut to get to the next alignment point. You never want to tighten it anymore, just loosen it. Now step seven says install the outer jam nut to the prescribed torque on the previous page. That is in anywhere between the 150 to 400 foot pounds depending on the type of spindle. So please verify the ch with the chart prior to applying that load. You can also again refer to TP89159. Now this allows us to really rotate the hub to actually do the inspection for the one to five thousandths. So let's verify. We're going to attach the dial indicator to the end of the spindle. If the drum is installed, just make sure the drum is uh, the fasteners are tightened up so you can do it with the wheel on, drum on, or just bare spindle. There may be some variances of how much force you can actually pull, so it will show a slight difference in the actual end play you achieve. 
the more weight, usually the more uh, uh, pin play that you can achieve. So when you look at, let's verify now. So adjust that indicator to the surface of where the, uh, the hot cap boats. Set the dial to zero. Grab a hold at three o'clock and nine o'clock and push in and rotate. This point in time, you can pull back out. You can watch that gauge and see the high point in either direction and add those two together if they go on each side of the zero marking. Otherwise, push in, set your dial indicator to zero, then rotate out and do that repeatedly, adjusting your indicator to zero until you can get uh, a more easily read from zero to five reading. Repeat that procedure until you can achieve that reading. So if end play is not in spec, I've got too much end play, what do I do? So you're gonna take the outer nut loose, and this is in a three nut system, take the outer nut loose, move that uh, locking washer back, and now you're gonna take and you're gonna index the nut to the next locking or next uh, indicated location to lock in the washer on the nut, or if it's the snap ring version two piece design, you're rotating it to the next indicated mark on the surface. Again, tighten the outer nut, check. If it's insufficient in flight, you're gonna do basically the same procedure, but you're gonna turn the nut counterclockwise to the next adjustment location. Sometimes technicians that are the in place within spec is between four and five. I want it just a little tighter. Well, you can, in some of the systems, achieve that. On the three nut system, the washer that has holes in it can actually take the outer nut out, take the washer out, rotate it to the opposite side, put it back in. That is a half increment. That will allow you to fine tune the system. The two piece nuts with the snap ring so those indication marks are usually in increments of a thousand. So the final step is to reassemble, torque the outer nut, and again, verify with the dial indicator. So let's talk about lubrication. So we got oil filled and grease filled hubs. So when we were installing, we had to fill the cavity for the grease filled hub at the beginning of the installation of, of the hub. So we're gonna fill the cavity all the way up to the bearing diameter we need race diameter, we're gonna fill that cavity completely up and we're gonna pack grease into each of the rollers, packing in from the lower, smaller side of the roller to the larger side and make sure grease is packed into every roller. Then you install the nuts. On the lubrication or oil filled side, that can include oil as well as semi-fluids, you're gonna fill the fluid up after the installation of the hub. So you're gonna fill it in through the front of the cap, through a plug, Sometimes some of them have plugs in the side of the cap, or there may be a plug in the actual hub itself. Drive axles, sometimes you with the, ax with the uh, axle shaft out, you may have to uh, pump the lubrication in through the first bearing. You should do that prior to doing the end flight at that time. But the end result is when you fill the lubrication in, we do not want you to fill above the full mark. Because again, as it sits there and you filled it up, you may overfill it. If you overfill, you're basically going to churn more oil, create more heat. Heat creates pressure. Pressure has to be exhausted through either through a venting in the hub cap. And if there's no vent in the hub cap, it has to vent through the seal. And that means you're forcing the lips of the seal into the journal and it's going to wear faster. So if it's a venting hub cap, that's when you see the misting. You'll see the misted oil on the outside of the hub cap, which collects all the dirt. So that confirms that someone overfilled the hub cap. Just keep that in mind. So let's talk about hub service kit. It's the rebuild solution. I'm not replacing the assembly, I'm replacing just the components. So we have them available for, for TN and TP axle applications, a three or five year warranty, package on parts only on highway and that warranty starts basically when you install the hub so your RO would be the starting point. What's included? In the three-year warranty you have a premium seal, 
a hubcap, can be an MTSI hubcap, or it, and a temper lock spindle nut. The advantage of this is with the temper lock spindle nut, either you're only going to do in play, or later on you wanted to convert to a preload system, you would not have to change the nut. The five year warranty kits add in Meritor Genuine matched bearing sets to achieve that five year warranty. So here are the part numbers. You can either have an oil or grease field hubcap, TN and TP axles, either with or without MTIS capable hubcaps, and then you can do either the three or five, five year warranty. Parts are all in a kit, simple, don't have to order multiple numbers. Thank you very much for your time. I'm Eric Ayad, Product Technical Specialist for Meritor. You have a great day.